Hello, my name is Clara Maveglia. In 2010, I set up the Cultural Entrepreneurship Institute. Today, my guest is Giacomo Rizzolatti, the neurophysiology who discovered the mirror neurons. We are in Berlin at the International Congress of Clinical Neurophysiology. Welcome to our community, Professor Rizzolatti. Professor Rizzolatti, welcome to our online community. I'm very pleased that you've been able to make some time for us. You're going to talk to us today about mirror neurons, but uh, I'd also like to hear something about your life and how you managed to make such a significant discovery. So I'll let you introduce yourself. I'm a neuroscientist. I have a degree in medicine. I then specialized in neurology. And then there was a point in my career when I started spending more time on research and became pretty well a full-time researcher. I trained in Padova and then in Pisa. One of the best centers in uh, Europe uh, was in Pisa with Professor Moruzzi. I went abroad to Canada and also to Pennsylvania. I became a university lecturer in Parma, specializing in neurophysiology. And since then, I have tended to focus on research rather than treating patients. So you say you're basically a researcher, but you did once say that you'd done something that you could compare to poetry. Do you consider yourself a poet? No, I might say I'm a philosopher. Philosopher in what sense? Well, I think if you're dealing with neurology, Back in those days, when I started out in neurology, we were looking at Roussel, Merleau-Ponty. There was a philosophical dimension to that. It was almost seen as the philosophy of medicine. When we discovered mirror neurons, we did, of course, turn to philosophy, because interpreting others' behavior is something which takes you into the arena of phenomenology, continental philosophy. It takes you away from the more American-style uh, philosophy of Butnam and so on, the more logical approach. So there's this philosophical issue as to whether we are reasoning and mentalizing, and that is how we understand uh, others, or whether we understand others because there is something of the other within ourselves. There's a kind of a copy of the same thing which unites us. Is this something you note during interaction, during observation, interaction with others, observation of others' feelings? What else is there in life? <laughs> Actions and emotions are what define our uh, behavior. Before we come on to the key point, I wanted to ask you another question about your career. Did you have it all planned out in advance or did you play it by ear? No, it's almost by chance, really. I started in experimental neurophysiology in Pisa because my mentor said that to be a good neurologist you have to have a basic science and he said go to Pisa and then, this is more for the sake of an uh, anecdote, I went back into neurology with Professor Terzian but he had gone to Sardinia so, you can imagine having been in an international centre like Pisa with Nobel Prize winners rubbing shoulders with you, Eccles, Huber and so on, being in a centre where the general language was English, to then go to a city like Cagliari, where basically what was needed was practical neurology, it wasn't a very rewarding experience. It seemed like a waste of time. So I asked Professor Moruzzi whether it might be possible to uh, come back into uh, neurophysiology. So it wasn't that I didn't like treating, treating patients, it was uh, that I wanted to go into research. It's, it wasn't really my dream to decide whether a drunkard was mad or not. Okay, so neurophysiology 
di un neurofisiologo di What kind of day-to-day -day life does that bring with it? It can be boring. You have to prepare materials if you're working with animals, you have to prepare the animals and uh, so on. So it's not like writing poetry, uh, sitting at home and looking out the window. You need to do a lot of uh, preparation. There's a, a lot of routine work on uh, presentation and there's a lot of craftsmanship at too. So what is the fascination of being a neuro Physiologist. Well, if an experiment goes well, you discover all kinds of things and all your preparation bears fruit. You find out what's going on and you can replicate your experiment. So you're an expert, you've worked at a as a researcher. Some basic questions. What's the brain? What is conscience? What are emotions? Okay, too many questions at once. The brain is something inside you that, of course, we can study and look into. Conscience or consciousness is something that I think it's better to try not to try to define. We all know what it is, but uh, you, you would end up uh, falling into banalities if you try to give a definition. Emotions, the third question. The best way to say it, I think, is to say that sometimes we have such a strong stimulus that our behavior is affected. Our emotions take hold of us. It can be survival instinct, especially with a negative emotion. When you're in pain, you have to act. You have to deal with the source of the pain. So there we see forms of behavior that dominate others. This leads me to another question, something I often uh, wonder about when I'm looking into this issue of what researchers do, because on the one hand the researcher is an observer, you need a distance, but you also need empathy. How do you resolve that uh, dilemma? You spoke about pain. Well, I would draw a distinction here. A doctor, a psychiatrist, and so on, will need empathy. If you're a researcher looking into mitochondria and uh, so on, you don't need empathy at that point. You need to look at what you're looking at, cognitive neuroscience we'll be looking at basic neurophysiology, biochemistry, genetics, and I don't think that empathy is so relevant to that. It, it is relevant when you come into relationships with uh, others. Of course, you need empathy for your uh, interpersonal relationships in order to be happy. So as a doctor then, how do you suppress your empathy? Well, I'm not a surgeon, uh, and a doctor doesn't need to suppress anything. A neurologist needs to listen to patients and have empathy in order to understand what the patient is suffering. A surgeon is a different matter. A surgeon does need to suppress things, because if you start saying, oh dear, poor thing, I'm going to hurt him, oh dear, he's going to bleed, then uh, you won't be a very good surgeon, will you? And in fact, surgeons very often won't operate on members of their own family, their own children or uh, wives, because they would be too emotionally affected by that. You do need a distance in order to operate on someone. So neurosurgeons are a special case, let's say. But let's talk about mirror neurons now. When did you realize that mirror neurons were something special? That mirror neurons were different to everything else that you had seen thus far? Well, I would say there were various stages. The first stage was the surprise when we discovered these strange uh, neurons. That there seemed to be neurons that were responding in a stranger way. For instance, in, uh, monkeys, there were huge surprises at that early stage. What on earth can this mean? We were saying. Then we went through to a discussion stage. What is the purpose for understanding and so on? What are they doing? We began to 
uh, find out a bit more there. And then there was a kind of escalation as the specialized publications for neuroscientists came out. We started being contacted by other people out in the big wide world. For instance, someone from France wrote to me and uh, compared me to uh, Roussel and Merleau Ponty and so on. My name, Ritzolati, suddenly thrown in. I said, oh, being mentioned in the same breath as these people. So then it was clear that there was a philosophical dimension. I was asked to Strasbourg, to the Collège de France, to give lectures, and artists got interested in the work too. So it was a snowball effect, if you like. But right at the beginning, we gave an interpretation to this, and then I think what happened was that people could identify with that explanation of behavior. So, can you give us a definition of a mirror neuron, then? Well, a mirror neuron is really a mechanism. We found that there was a mechanism that was working in our emotions, in various animals, in birds, and we saw that there was a function to connect one to another. So there was a sensorial perception that was turning into motor action or into emotion. Emotions are the easiest way to explain this to somebody who is not a scientist. So let's say if I see someone who is in pain, the same neurons will be activated in my brain as when I am in pain. So there's a conceptual uh, difference there which has an impact on philosophy. The mechanism there is not a logical one. I can understand that you are in pain or you are unhappy. And the way I understand that is by feeling it. And that is the nature of that empathy. So you can say that human beings are influenced by each other. Yes, otherwise we would end up overly narcissistic or with another kind of psychiatric con condition. A lot of young people are unhappy because of the excessive individualism of our culture. They find it hard to form relationships and be with others because it's hard to make compromises, it's hard to make concessions, give in and see the other's viewpoint. So, is it possible to intervene on the nervous system? My own view, and I believe others share this, is that we are born with a mechanism which brings us into contact with others, the mother-child relationship, a classic example. The mother loves a child, the child loves a mother. We have an innate mechanism to get on with others. You and I are similar. We'll get on. Then, as the years go by, different cultural factors come into play. So it's nature and nurture and culture. And it depends whether your culture supports interpersonal relationships or favours the opposite. I should be selfish, each for himself. So it's no coincidence that an Italian should have discovered this. No, my, my mum's Russian anyway, so I'm mixed blood, so no, no, I, I wouldn't go there. My own training was in Pisa, that was a very international group with people of all sorts of different nationalities. Then I did a year of psychology in the US, then I was visiting professor in California. So I think science is an international domain. Art may be a different matter, there may be a national imprint on it, but I don't think it applies here. What about Levi Montalcini? Montalcini was Italian, but uh, what does that mean? She was an international figure. No, I was thinking more about social skills. Will there be a pill that we'll be able to take tomorrow to make socialization easier? Well, I think what we have to take account of is that if somebody is ill and has socialization problems and then they can take a pill to get better, great. But if someone is healthy and is then taking this kind of pill, I think that's a problem because people could go too far, could have all kinds of consequences. So I think we should let 
normal people develop in their own way and obviously if there is some sort of defect and there is some sort of product to deal with that, that's uh, something and uh, I think this idea of uh, the, the sick person protesting against society was a myth of the 60s, sick people are sick, but what about depression? Now, there are all sorts of negative emotions which uh, we medicalize now. Well, that will depend on the doctor that you go to. I think that is more of a personal issue. Our society likes people to be fine. I'd certainly say that. Think of the prevalence of gyms and uh, taking different uh, products, think of the amount of time that people spend and the money that people spend on going to the gym and looking after their skin and uh, so on, trying to look beautiful. In one of your speeches, you mentioned the fact that the monkeys that you were working on had not been trained in the way they had been in other countries, that in fact they were allowed to play. When people say, how did you manage to discover mirror neurons, I often say that one of the great things about Gentilucci, Martelli, the people working in the late 60s up until the 80s, we're saying, let's see how the nervous system operates in nature, in a, a natural situation, not put a monkey in a certain position and see how it moves and then draw conclusions about coordination and movement and uh, so on. It was trying to create a natural habitat and I think that's what gave rise to certain insights. Obviously controlled conditions can be useful but I think this is a highly significant aspect. It brings us closer to uh, reality and obviously we can then look at the parameters having observed what has uh, happened and we were looking into perception, emotions and other more complex matters. On gender, people say women are more emotional. Is it possible that women might have more mirror neurons than men? Well, if you start looking into emotions and you want to find out more, it's much more interesting to work with women than with men. There are more areas of the brain that are active and following our research on pain, Tanya Zinger, worked with young women. They were given a shock and they saw their partner being given a shock and they reacted. Uh, hugely, they had a huge reaction. They had a, a much bigger... Uh, a reaction on seeing the other uh, suffer. Obviously, there's a danger in generalizing too much. It's about statistics. They can be very selfish and indifferent. Uh, women and men can have a high degree of uh, empathy, so it's a, a, a statistical observation, if you like. But certainly, I would say there is a higher probability that a woman will have a greater degree of empathy for others than a man will. Well, this is all very interesting. One question on robotics. Can you imagine that it might be possible for artificial life to be programmed using mirror neurons to make robots a lot more similar to humans? People are working in this area, but it's difficult. If you need internal machinery that has knowledge, for instance, and that responds to seeing others, that may be possible if you have programs that are activated when you see something similar happening in another, I don't see why not, it, it could be feasible. I certainly see it as more feasible than the highly complex artificial brain, because what we're talking about is bringing one extra mechanism. But obviously imagining a conscious robot is quite a huge step. But this opens up all sorts of new horizons 
in terms of helping people, helping the environment, problems of individuals, people with disabilities, people who have mobility issues, for instance. What next for you in terms of research? We are looking into several lines of research at present. One which may sound rather abstruse is a dichotomy between tasks that are performed through the use of mirrors and others that are performed through mentalizing. And I think it would be very interesting to find a bridge between the two. We're working with an excellent Austrian group of psychologists at present to find out what happens in the brain when we take others' perspectives. So let's say that you are sitting there and you want to know what I see. So we've got an object here. And another one behind it. So I can see two objects. You can only see one. So if I say to you, how many objects can Rizzolati see? If you can see that I put that there, you can say two. But how do you know there are two? You know there are two because you're putting yourself in my position. It's a very difficult task for autistic children, for instance. And uh, if you ask an autistic child uh, how many objects can Rizzolati see, they might well just say one because that's what they can see. So this is a kind of uh, another level of performance of the task. And then there's the point that you were making earlier where we're now looking into modelling of this process to apply it to robots. We're working with Michael Arbit and other people who work on the modelling of neurons and circuits and there's a team in Genoa that will be looking at whether this can be put into a robot. We're also working on autism. Our dream is to have early diagnosis of autism in the first or second year. That's very difficult. There are a lot of bureaucratic obstacles. How do you get in touch with families, get families to write down the first symptoms, working with paediatricians and so on? It's difficult and it's costly. So there's a management issue there as well as a scientific one. So, if there were more resources, is that the first thing you would do? Yes. I have a very good relationship with the director of the health service in Parma. And there we set up an autism centre in a former school, but there are limited funds available. There are some projects that really require much higher level of funding because people won't work for nothing. And if you ask paediatricians to do something beyond their normal call of duty, a whole battery of extra tests and uh, so on, you're talking about 30, 50 euros per test and somebody's got to pay for that. How important is a team in research? Absolutely vital I've been lucky. When I arrived in Parma, physiology was not doing well. One professor left, a new one came in who gave me a lot of help, but we were struggling. And I was very lucky. Professor Moruzzi brought in lots of foreigners. He was well known. And he brought in lots of people from Eastern Europe, and Russia. So since I'm Russian, he sent people to me and we had an Italo-Russian team that worked very well. So I was lucky. That was a time when you didn't have PhD students yet. That was one of the few intelligent Italian reforms that uh, came in. So you had technical assistants and so on, but you needed help from abroad. If you couldn't bring in foreigners, it was very hard to do research in those days. Well, thank you very much. You've told us a, a lot of very interesting things. Do you have a message for 
for people who may want to study neurophysiology. Two things, you need to want to do some hard work and you need to be modest. If you're dreaming of curing cancer or curing uh, schizophrenics, what you need to do is actually do modest observation and you may find all kinds of things as we did. You need to work on that science, molecular biology, whatever it is, rather than starting by saying, I'm going to find the cure for cancer. You need to start by saying, how does a mitochondrion operate? So you're close to the mystery of, of life. What actually counts in life? I'm not close to the mysteries of life. I would say that what we've discovered is that empathy and social relationships are vital to well-being. Since the 60s, a different message has been sent out. If you think of the Berkeley philosophy, the young person saying, I'm free, I do what I like, it doesn't work. You have to have relationships with others, and work together with others. That's the message. And I think one thing that backs up my argument is that if you think about how species survive, species survive by reproducing. And if a species does not reproduce, then it will become extinct. And we live in a society where it's hard to have children, so something is wrong. So you need to make compromises to be with others. Is that it? Well, let me tell you a little story that I told in Milan recently at um, a railway station. It's an old lady and a beautiful girl. The beautiful girl said, I'm fed up with men, I don't want anything to do with them. And the old lady said, yes, I understand that you're feeling desperate. What are you doing, going off on a trip to clear your head? And the girl said, no, I'm buying a dog. That's very interesting, isn't it? Why is she buying a dog? Oh, because dogs are lovely. They're the best people there are. They obey you. They run up to you. They're pleased to see you. As soon as you get home, they uh, jump all over you. Your boyfriend doesn't. Boyfriends are more difficult to deal with. Boyfriends can get tired. Boyfriends can not want to go to the cinema when you want to go to the cinema. You have to make compromises. And you don't with a dog. That's what frightens me. That a young girl, instead of saying, I'll find another boy, says, I'll find a dog. The dog will make me happy. Okay, well, let's hope for a greater degree of empathy. People do come to me from companies quite often and say, what should office relationships be like? Because if you have a boss who's uh, shouting at everyone and, and so on, is that good? Is that good or bad? And I say, bad. No, people pretend to obey, but they are not actually really cooperating. They're not feeling. Empathy. If you can create empathy, then society and business will work better. So, something positive. How can you create a system based on empathy? I don't know. Start off by being nice to each other. The points I've been making, saying it's easier to live alongside other people, get on with other people, and be successful if you are nice to people. So yes, be nice, be polite. I don't want to sound like uh, I'm uh, proselytizing for uh, Catholicism, but uh, uh, the new Pope was talking about saying, do say please and thank you. And uh, there is a lot of vulgarity. People say, hey, you, over there, uh, whatever. And I think that that uh, aggressive tone in language can also affect our relationships. It's nothing to do with religion. I'm talking about a, a biological mechanism that governs our relationship with others. <laughs> Are you surprised by that? No, I'm delighted because we want to spread that kind of message. And a positive message is very useful. Spread positivity. But you might feel silly doing this from time to time. And what you've done is given me some scientific evidence to say that what we're doing in relation to ethics is worthwhile. 
ethics is nothing to do with religion. Ethics comes from our own biological nature. Without ethics, we would not be able to live together, especially not in a modern society where there's so much uh, destruction. It's actually a miracle that we can live together at all. You only need three terrorists to make life impossible for everyone. So intolerance is what uh, uh, dominates in uh, terrorism. No, I work against this, of course. I think most people are tolerant. What we are struck by is a group of uh, terrorists. If you have 50,000 football fans, you only need a dozen violent people. However, many, you know, 49,990 who weren't violent, uh, it's one group that attracts attention. I think most people are basically nice. Well, thank you so much. It's been very interesting. And I think it's the first time that I have been able to find a scientific corroboration of the work that I do. So thank you very much.